Met Jesus on a pilgrimage, still walking. I'm Andy Doyle, the Bishop of Texas, and that's my six-word autobiography. My hope for this podcast is to walk with you and talk with you about God, the church, and where we're headed next. Heavenly Father, I humbly beseech you to see before you a sheep of your own fold, a lamb of your own flock, and a sinner of your own redeeming. The name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. So, uh, I have been preaching over the last 15 weeks on the Nicene Creed, one of the oldest confessional statements that the church has. It came to agreement first 300 years. And I've, we say it every Sunday in our Episcopal worship, and so I decided I would kind of take a piece by piece over weeks. So you can go on to uh, your whatever podcast thing you want to look at and listen to the other pieces. Uh, <clears throat> but today is Christ the King Sunday, and it just so happens, without any planning on my own, that we, <laughs> that we come <laughs> to the words in the creed that say, he will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. And you might have noticed that all Ezekiel and Ephesians and the Gospel of Matthew are all focused on this very statement. How serendipitous for you all. <laughs> so, um, yeah, now you're a little nervous. Uh, and I'll tell you, I, think, I actually think we should be a little nervous. I mean, I listened to those lessons, right? Uh, and... Uh, I probably am not the best at keeping up all those lessons. Uh, and I think part of, the, part of what we struggle with is just not being honest about that. So we try to pretend like we're doing the very best uh, and, and following all the rules when the truth is I don't think we are. So let me start here. The first followers of Jesus experienced the person of Jesus as the coming of God, right? So at the very bare minimum, no matter what you think, those people who met Jesus thought they had met God himself in the way that he preached, the way he taught, the way he healed people. That was the only way they understood that they could explain who Jesus was uh, and consequently that Jesus rose again, that they had very real experiences of a risen Lord. Uh, and that that, uh, uh, that continued uh, as others had similar experiences and was eventually passed on till we get the scriptures, which then reflect back to us these stories, uh, this narrative of God, if you will. But one of the things that I think is really important to understand in all of that is that they didn't have a New Testament while they were following Jesus around. That came later. The only thing they had was the Old Testament. And so passages like Ezekiel, passages like Isaiah and Daniel, Zechariah, all of them speak of a God who will come again to judge the living and the dead. And so they understood that because this Messiah, Jesus, had died and was risen, that there was going to be another coming of God. They, there was no way they could kind of get around that. They, they, they read the scriptures. They saw who Jesus was. They said he was God. They understood that he was risen. And so they understood also with all of that that Jesus himself was going to come again uh, and that most likely he was going to come back to uh, Jerusalem. The other piece of this, which I think is really important, is that the first witnesses also tell us that they understood that Jesus believed this. That Jesus himself, and scholars continue to believe this, that Jesus himself thought that if he went to Jerusalem, this coming of God was going to happen as well. He knew that whatever had to happen, he had to go to Jerusalem for all the other things then uh, to, uh, to take place. And that Paul himself, after his conversion, understood this. And Paul thought it was going to happen pretty quick. So a lot of times as we read the lessons from Paul, what we find there in Paul's, uh, Paul's letters is this sense that Jesus is coming back soon. So 
if you find yourself without a spouse, don't remarry, he says. He gives a lot of instructions about what to do, but those instructions all come right out of this idea that Jesus is coming imminently. I mean, it's going to happen. And so as people continue to live, wait in expectation, uh, what we find is that uh, the first uh, apostles, the first uh, bishops, the first priests and deacons, all of them begin to live longer and longer lives without Jesus coming back. And so when we get to something like the creed, which is created essentially after a hundred years worth of arguing about it, uh, is that Jesus will come again. In other words, they, they decided that this was a key and faithful piece of their understanding as Christians, that Jesus would come and that Jesus was uh, going uh, to judge. Um, and so as we, as we go along, I think it's important for us to recognize that um, uh, eternal, uh, eternal earth and cosmos is not a guarantee <laughs> uh, that, that, that things will end uh, at some point. And in fact, one might even say that the world might come to an end before the cosmos comes to the end. And that Jesus and God has taught us that uh, God created all things. And so that's all possible. And unlike many fundamentalists, what I would say and suggest is there is nothing that we can do that's going to bring God back. So no, no ruining the earth is going to bring God back. No war in Israel is going to bring God back. Nothing's going to. God will come when God is ready to come back. <laughs> That's one of the things about gods is they don't typically do what humans want them to do. They typically do what gods do. And so if God is all powerful and we place God in the heavenly places, as it says in scripture, then we have to recognize that God has all the power and decision making. Now, though we faithfully believe that God will come back, we don't know when that's going to be. We have no idea and we have no control over it. But we do continue to believe that God will come. And so even in our Eucharistic, and liter our, our Eucharistic prayer, we say that Christ has died, Christ has risen, Christ will come again. We sing the Sanctus, right? Where we say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. The reason why we say he is because we're referencing Jesus' second coming. So this, this idea is present in all of our liturgy, in all of our worship. We proclaim that blessed is this Jesus who will come and come again. Now I want to move quickly to the judging piece. Um, and that is that we believe that uh, there will be judgment. Now, that's what we see in the creed. That is all we say in the creed. We don't say when the judgment's going to happen. We don't say if the judgment has already happened, if the judgment's going to happen, there's a big argument about when judgment happens. All the theologians and different denominations have a lot of different ideas. Maybe it's going to come after a thousand years of peace. Maybe it'll come before a thousand years of peace. We don't, we don't really know, and we don't say what we know in the creed. We just say there will be judgment, and it's very possible that the judgment already happened, thus Christ's cross, crucifixion, resurrection, the opening of grace for all people, right? So it's very possible that, in fact, judgment has already taken place. And this is where I want to come to the passage that we had from Matthew's gospel today, right? With the separation of the sheep and the goats. We, when we typically hear this passage, get so focused on the separation part, we forget everything else. And the truth is, uh, you'll notice that the reason why people are separated is not by God's decision in Christ, is it? That's not why they're separated. Do you notice that? Right? The goats and the sheep are separated, but that's, it doesn't say that. That, that Jesus separates them out. He's not the one judging. Where did the judgment happen in that passage? It happened in life. The judgment happened when we decided to either see Jesus in the least, to visit him in prison, to share what we have, to do good works, to take care of them, to welcome the stranger. 
In other words, that's when the judgment happens. The judgment happens in us. And it is that judgment that will determine our ability to enter the kingdom of God. Now, people are like, oh, no, it's works righteousness. You all don't know anything about works righteousness. That's not works righteousness at all. It's just to say that when you come to the heavenly kingdom, if you can't recognize God, why would you say yes to coming in? If you can't see God in the world now, what makes you think you're going to see God then? Now, I particularly think it's going to be really hard to say in the face of God, right? In the face of God, oh, oh, I won't kneel, right? You know what I'm saying? That like for me, in the face of God, I think it's going to be really hard for everybody to say, oh my gosh, yeah, I don't want any part of this, right? But, but just for a moment, let's go with the Matthew passage. I want to keep on this Matthew passage because we got to deal with what's in the scripture. I want to suggest that I probably, probably fall in a little more like C.S. Lewis, Okay, great Anglican uh, theologian. He has a book. It's a little book. Uh, so you can check it out and make sure the bishop's not just, you know, like making it up. Uh, it's called The Great Divorce. And in it, uh, the way that he describes, and I would describe the way this works, is that grace and redemption are available to all people based upon Jesus' love and upon his cross. I believe it will be most difficult indeed to be confronted by God and regardless of if our end comes uh, upon death or Christ's return, uh, I just can't imagine that face to face as I've said that we could resist God's love and grace. Yet it is the willingness to accept grace that seems to be the key in all of this. Christ is at once taking care of God's judgment in C.S. Lewis's theology. Christ serves by his inviting and welcoming rather than condemning. And in Matthew's gospel, understands that, the gospel author understands, this is key work for us. In other words, that we are to be like Jesus was and do this loving, caring, caring for others uh, work. And that that decision to accept or reject Christ's victory determines how we live our lives And like Lewis, I want to emphasize complete free will here. In other words, God cannot force us to love God. God has given us free will, and that free will is going to last till the very last moment. Humans cannot be forced, you see, into that relation. And our own decisions and inclinations lead us to either serve God through others or not. Provided in the cross and resurrection, we always have this opportunity to choose to judge differently. But in this way, it's not God's judgment that I fear so much, but my own and yours. Because you see, when we place ourselves at the center of all of life, when we think we've got all truth inside of us, that we have enough wisdom to judge everything in the world, we know how it all should be, when we make our wants and desires the primary goal of living life, in other words, when we live as if truly the one with the most toys wins, right? When we become so engrossed in our selfishness, it's really hard for us to see that God is inviting us constantly to embrace Christ in our lives. And... As C.S. Lewis points out in his book, it becomes very hard for us to accept Christ's grace. So here's here's how that works. In the great divorce is a wonderful woman, and she is divorced. But she won't go to heaven because God let her ex-husband in. She can't accept that God's grace was big enough to accept him. So she stays out. Right? So it is this judgment, if you will, this judgment in life and a judgment in that moment. Can we get over ourselves enough to accept God's love and mercy? Can we get over ourselves enough to see that maybe I should be helping people? 
Maybe I should be caring for the poor. Maybe I should be welcoming the strangers. Maybe this is the work that Jesus does that I should be inhabiting in this world, if you will, as a practice to be enabled to say yes to God's grace and mercy when I arrive or when Christ comes again. So I'll conclude with this. I've given you a lot to think about. My guess is you all have a thousand more questions. And I'm happy to answer all of them before I leave in three hours. All right? And then that's it. You're on your own. Uh, But I, I believe this. I believe that God will come. I may see God face to face before God comes back. Right? That's that's highly likely. But I still believe God will come. And I believe judgment is involved. On the one hand, I've already been judged guilty of failing my Lord, but Christ's grace is big enough if I practice to say yes when I come to that moment. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Thank you for listening. Join me in conversation on Twitter at Texas Bishop and spread the word about this podcast by leaving a review on iTunes. Thank you.